Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the OSINT Curious Podcast Webcast. I'm Micah Hoffman, back after, well, what seems to be a month off, which it wasn't really off, but I missed you all very much. I'm so happy to be here with uh, the other OSINT Curious members. Um, let's go ahead and um, uh, retu. Why don't you say hi to everybody and then pass it on to somebody else? All right. Hey, everyone. Ritu here. Um, happy to be here and excited that you all attended and uh, excited for a good show. And I'll uh, pass it over to Sector. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another webcast. I um, hope you send in some nice questions for us during the AMA. And I'm going to send it off to Laurent. Hi everyone, thanks for uh, tuning in. Uh, I'm also very excited to be here straight from my kitchen, so I'm really looking forward to this episode. Who do you want to pass it to, Laurent? Yeah. Oh yeah, um, pass it to uh, Technizet. Hi everyone, it's Technizet. I'm really happy to be here again and looking forward to answer all of the AMAs today. So passing over to Gumshoe. Hey everybody, John Turbush, the Gumshoe on Twitter. Happy to be back on and uh, glad to have you all join us today. I'll pass it over to Matthias. Hey, everyone. This is Matthias, also known as MW OSINT. And again, I'm excited to be on the show. And this time, no video for me. You're just going to have to listen to my voice. Nice. And what a, what a nice voice that is to listen to. I could listen to that every other week for a year and not be annoyed. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Welcome, and we've got a uh, cast of, uh, of attendees here. Thank you for coming. Uh, because you are here live, I'd like to invite each of you and Ted Nies to go ahead and submit any questions that you have using the Q&A feature of the Zoom. Ask us anything OSINT related or privacy related that you want, um, and we are here to answer it. Uh, we figured that after doing guest after guest after guest for a while, it might be good just to take a break and to talk directly to you. Now, uh, there are some things that we need to, um, to take a look at because I know that some of you have tweeted in different content. So let's take a look at a couple of the tweets while people are still tweeting or uh, putting things in the Q&A. Uh, let's take a look at some of the tweets that have come in. We'll start off with this one. And... Uh, OSINT Curious members, just go ahead and chime in here. Uh, the question is from uh, Stephen Ward, and uh, he says, let's see, what's your advice regarding keeping a public profile for pet potential employers to see our work while also keeping OPSEC in mind? Could being too public or using a pseudonym, pseudonym hurt getting security clearance or passing background checks? So, I think there's a bunch of things in that. One is, what do you all think about having work and personal uh, and social media profiles? I know that some places it's not um, not supported as, as well as others. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I don't have a work profile. Um, the only uh, accounts that I use are all under the name of Sector035. Um, people know it's me. Um, so I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, I don't need to have any accounts in my real name and I choose not to do it anyway. Okay, so you have, have focused more on the OPSEC and privacy aspect of it um, while still interacting in the OSINT community in the social media world. Um, what about like Gumshoe, uh, Ritu and, and Lizette? I know that each of you have, have been in that I'm a very private person world and lately you've kind of um, explored the more public side of it. Um, do any one of you want to share maybe the tips that you've used I guess I would say um, it, it kind of depends on your situation, right? Like when I was just working as a private investigator doing information security things, um, I didn't really have any public profiles out there at all. Now that I'm doing more like with, uh, with our crew at OSINT Curious, teaching for SANS, uh, I find it is helpful to actually have a bit of a public profile out there, but I share very little about you know my personal life there. I'm not on social media for personal reasons. Um, so I try to keep it pretty professional. I think you can do that. 
uh, and still maintain some operational security and, you know, not do anything that would be off-putting to future employers. And so, so going public is, is fine. You filter and censor what you would, would post there thinking about the, the, the working world and the professionalness of your account. Would you say that? Right. And, and there's a balance there, right? Uh, you know, you are giving up some privacy by putting yourself out there. Absolutely. So it, everyone is going to have to make their judgment on where they want to go on that scale. Okay. Three, two. Was that you have any thoughts? I would say I agree. I agree. Oh, sorry. sorry I was going to say I agree as well. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Lizette. Yeah, I agree too. Um, I must say, uh, I was looking to find the, there's a saying like, um, I'm going to look up the saying because it's very, um, uh, how do you say it? it? It matches the situation. Well, Ritu, give an answer first and I will look up the saying. Just one sec. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to kind of second what Gumshoe was saying and in terms of, yeah, I agree. Um, but also, you know, if you decide to go, I think there's no, there's not a wrong answer, but if you decide to go more public, um, you know, keeping the balance between, you know, you're not representing, say, the organization you work for or that kind of stuff. That's always important to keep in mind as well. Um, but yeah, no, I, I uh, that's kind of my thoughts on that. Yeah, I, and and realistically, I mean, I, I'm one that that has that that web breacher personal and private account, uh, so I'm tweeting out personal things and professional things from there. And what I find is every now and then somebody's like, hey, that's, you know, you shouldn't be entering your political views into your tweet. Um, this should just be OSINT. And the reality is, is I have other OSINT personas on, on Twitter that are just OSINT or just personal. So um, Twitter makes it pretty easy for us to segment our lives. If we want, when we're talking about Twitter, other platforms are a little bit more challenging sometimes. All right, cool. Let's go to our next one. Uh, the next one that I wanted to show you is by, I'm going to mess up this person's name. I know this. It's either Dre Krugs or Dr. E. Krugs or Drek Rugs, or I could pronounce this a lot of other ways and I'll still, I'll still botch it. But uh, let's see. So uh, this was a reply to Technozet and I think uh, Technozet, you are going to be talking about some of this today. The question is, is it possible to investigate social media, particularly Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, that require logins without a login? How can I get more info than just the standard page? Looking forward to hashtag OSINT curious. So thoughts on getting into places where we need a username or a login, but we don't have them because, you know, some places are making it harder for us. What are your thoughts? I must say that it's incredibly difficult, especially uh, when you're looking at the mobile platforms to investigate something without having a research account or a sock puppet on there. I mean, like Twitter is probably the most easiest one because there's a public and there's a private uh, setting for your tweets. So in the public one gives you the, the possibility to investigate more. Well, Instagram is moving away from having the opportunity to uh, look at the profiles without being logged in. You often now get the pop-up saying, hey, you need to log in to view this content. Facebook gives you a limited amount of information and everything is moving either behind the login or to a mobile platform. So have, not having the opportunity to have a research account makes it very, very, very hard. I'm very happy that I'm allowed to in my work. Yeah, I think that's a good point that you added at the end there is that, you know, people think, well, I'll just create a fake account. But there are many people out there that are legally not allowed to create false accounts, research accounts, synthetic identities on social media platforms. So doing investigations and getting into those platforms is a little bit of a challenge for for some platforms. Uh, we can use tips and tricks like the Google mobile friendly test site. Uh, we see that that can go into some places in LinkedIn and other places. If you're interested in that, Google mobile friendly test site. And we have a 10 minute tip that Nico Dutchos and Guide did. There's also some other sites that will allow us to use their sock puppets to get into places. 
I'm wondering, Gumshoe, Laurent, Matthias, Ritu, Knit Sector, any thought? Any other thoughts? I yeah. think one of the, the things you have to uh, do when you can't log on for certain reasons is just go back to the OSINT basics. Um, so there are a lot of sites out there that might scrape social media and, and might basically scrape the images, the, the posts and things like that. Maybe sometimes before accounts were kind of locked down with the privacy settings. So it all comes back to kind of like basic Googling or, or using your, your search engines um, on those specific secondary sites um, that will allow you to, to find things. But then you have to keep in mind that a lot of this data is, is out where this information is actually outdated. Yeah, yeah just I agree with that. Oh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just to add to what just uh, Matthias said. So I also agree, it depends also on the platform and Google is also one of the a really good um, technique is when you use the site operator and you site limited to specific platforms. If you're lucky and the, the content was public and also indexed by one of these search engines, you may find something. But I guess if you look into an individual and you want specific information about that individual, I highly doubt that it was indexed, especially when it comes to new platforms like Minds or some, some other um, newly decentralized platforms, for instance, as well. So it becomes more difficult, but it's always worth just checking with Google or social media search engines or like aggregators that um, also Matthias mentioned. Yeah, there, there are some platforms like Technoset said that you pretty much have no choice if you want to get that full data. But again, there are sometimes third party resources. Um, as Laurent said, there, there, there may be other ways to get that data, but it may vary in quality and, and the time might might be outdated and so on. So there may be some workarounds, but typically your best bet is to have have a sock puppet on that platform. Thanks everybody. And um, we're gonna probably have uh, Technozet give a little bit of a preview of a blog post that she wrote for us on this topic of how do you find like Facebook information on a profile that is private, uh, private profile. So we might have access to the platform, but with the user accounts being protected or private or otherwise non-public, we have additional barriers. And like Matias said, you know, it's, it's a matter of going back, what do you have? What can you get? And then doing searches and pivots and, and other things. So um, well done everybody. Okay, let's move to some of the questions that our current audience is posing here. Um, all right, OSINT curious people. Uh, question from NoSint from Josh saying, uh, OPSEC question. Do you use new phone numbers for different sock puppets or do you recycle them? Go. New. New, always? Yes. Okay, yes. but you're over in the Netherlands. But yes, okay. I was going to mention that because- Go ahead. While living in the Netherlands, we have the opportunity to get prepaid phone numbers without a registration. So we don't need to ID in order to get a phone number. Phone numbers are either free or are sold at a euro per piece. So it's relatively cheap and easy for us to gain mobile phone numbers. While I know uh, the people in Belgium have a lot more difficulties getting a phone number because they need to ID themselves whenever they buy a phone number. I know this same thing happens in South Africa too and probably at other parts or countries in the world too. And it's a good cause if you're looking at prevention side because prepaid numbers are often used within criminal activities. So having a person connected to a phone number can maybe help out law enforcement. It makes us our job a little bit more difficult. <laughs> Yeah, so right. in Germany, we have a, the, the same situation, which, which basically applies EU-wide, that you have to um, register an ID to a phone number. But I think it also depends on the threat model or the threat environment you're working in. So if I register my personal ID to a phone number and would use that for sock puppets, um, the chances that maybe Facebook or Twitter or whatever would actually get to my real name based on this phone number are very slim, unless we have some kind of data breach along the road. Um, so... At the moment, not having any other possibility to get these burner phones, um, I actually turn to just using my real data because I can't get any other uh, um, SIM card without using that. And then using those phone numbers for, for sock puppets um, if it is something that is not too sensitive. Because the only way in Germany that someone would actually find a trace from the phone number to my name is if it's law enforcement or some kind of intelligence service. And if I'm on their radar, then something went majorly bad. <laughs> 
there i have other problems okay all right uh i was gonna mention uh mention in canada so we don't need to you know there, there's places you can walk in grab sim cards and they don't need id or any of that stuff um my first thing is when i see that question um from nocent is um if I can avoid using phone verification, I will. So, but creating sock puppets is one of the challenges is that we um, were constantly asked for the phone verification. If I can get past that, which I have been able to several times, um, it's great. But in the situation that I can't, you know, I, we have the ability to purchase that SIM card and, and have that new verification number. Um, and, and again, uh, every situation is a little different, but that's, uh, that's, that's what I think. Yeah. I think in, so. Go ahead. And in case I, I, I keep saying it to everyone in case you, um, they force you to have some kind of two factor authentication or whatever, please set up something like Google authenticator. Um, even if you lose a phone number, you have, uh, make sure you have something like a burner phone, a smartphone with Google Authenticator, because a physical smartphone and even a VM at a certain point will be trusted by parties like Facebook and Instagram. Um, I've been able to unlock accounts by using uh, an Android VM that I've had for over two years. And it was trusted by Google, for instance. Uh, I could unlock Google with it. I can unlock Facebook with it just because of the fact I have a Google Authenticator installed in it from the beginning on. So make sure you use those kind of things too. Okay. Yeah, putting uh, two-factor authentication or even two-step authentication, um, a lot of the, some of the, pro so here in the United States, there's a huge variety as, as I think Gumshoe will, will back me up here. There's a huge variety of options, whether you, you buy the, the Mint Mobile trial cards and you have one week to set up as many sock puppets as you can with that one number, then it expires. Whether you go with a prepaid, a burner phone, a voice over IP, which doesn't work as well, you get a real cell phone plan. Um, hang on one second, second is that. So you have all those dis different options. And and what I, the way I like to think of it is I put all of those in my toolbox and then depending upon the OPSEC level I need, hey, this is gonna be a longer term engagement. I'm gonna use a brand new number for those engagements that I've never used somewhere else where the social media platform's not gonna be, not gonna be able to know, hey, Micah used this and Micah used that. Um, go ahead, uh, Technizet, you wanna say something? Yeah, I was just wondering about if you're, I'm not familiar with the whole um, phone organization within the US. So if you have a number and it's only like valid for two weeks, will it then expire and we be brought like, can somebody else use that can number again? Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I imagine so. Just like some of the email platforms allow reuse of email addresses that are closed or deleted. Um, I, I had a student one time that was not a very ethical student um, back when I was teaching pen test. And he said, listen, I figured out this thing. Look, I find email addresses that are on this one or that one platform that people have tied to their social media and they've they've gone ahead and deleted the email address. So he would create an email address matching what was on the Twitter or the what other, and then he would trigger a password reset. It would go to his email address, which was the exact same one as the other one. And so, yeah, there, there is a possibility that you know, in the future, somebody else would get a text verification from Facebook or some other thing going, hey, validate this John Doe person. And it would be. You yeah, know, or it could be added to a group chat in like WhatsApp or Telegram or whatever. And you'll be might be ending up with things you don't want to know about. You, right. you definitely and, want to maintain control of your phone number as long as you're using it with a sock or whatever. You know, operational security is not just remaining hidden or whatever, but controlling the assets that you're using to operate. There are some platforms, absolutely, John. Um, there, there are some platforms where you log, let's just give the Mint Mobile scenario where you have one week with a trial um, uh, SIM and then 
the SIM disables. So you lose that phone number. There are many platforms you can get in, validate and verify with that phone number, then provide one or two additional methods for them to reset your password. Then you remove the phone number that's been validated and your account stays in a good state. But now if they need to uh, go ahead and, and uh, do something with your account to re reset it, they just send you an email or they send you an SMS or they ask you for an Authy or Google Authenticate code. All right, good discussion. Let's move on. Um, let's see, we have one here. Um, okay, uh, our our uh, our attendee Andrea asks, in your opinions, uh, what are some of the most important social media and other sites at the moment when investigating individuals and smaller groups, particularly smaller extremist groups. Ooh, since you said that, I know somebody that's going to want to chime in here. Laurent, why don't you take this first off? Well, I mean, uh, that's, a, that's a good question, and it's also constantly changing. So I won't name any specific websites, and this is just because of ethical reasons. Um, it, is, it depends, first of all, on what form of extremism you look at. So if you look at... Um, uh, Salafi jihadists, for instance, they have been around for quite a while and everyone knows where they are. I mean, um, Rocket Chat, Telegram and some other apps as well with the, with the far right. Um, it also depends on who you mean by the far right because it's, like uh, it's like a bigger organization. And it's also difficult to, and not, not difficult, but it's more complex. Um, and depending on what uh, groups you're looking at, uh, US-based, UK-based, Germany, I mean, there are also international links between these groups. So as you can imagine, they are all on the big major platforms because in the end, what these extremists or violent, violent extremists and terrorists want is of course to spread their propaganda. So they won't go to very niche platforms to spread propaganda on there. They want of course the bigger platforms. So you're gonna find them on there definitely. Uh, you need to know about the um, kind of like the keywords or the language they speak in order to find them. And I can also tell you there are other niche platforms um, that they use or also uh, messaging apps that they use and this is mainly for OPSEC purposes and what's interesting is with the with the far right as well they have also started or what I can increasingly see the term OSINT popping up there uh, a lot of the times and making also recommendations as to uh, what tools and software to use um, for uh, privacy purposes etc. So that's why I'm so, so it's showing that they're aware of people using OSINT techniques to locate them and how to make their, their yeah, I mean, chats more private. Yeah, exactly. So I found instances where they were deliberately sharing um, articles, OSINT articles as well. I mean, all the information that we put out there, it's, it's like a double edged sword. You can use it for good or bad. That's always the case with anything. But um, yeah, so. There and uh, I also have to say a lot of the, the users or some of the groups that I was looking into are also very they know what they do. So when when it comes to setting up websites, they know how to do that um, efficiently as well. Like highly like a very secure website as well. So it's really interesting to look at. But to answer the question on what websites they are, so one of the most important things that I recommend is monitoring them. And you can always see a reaction by one of the tech giants getting rid of them, removing them from one website, they will find a way of either getting bets or circumvent the kind of um, uh, things that were implemented or they migrate to a completely different website. But what often happens is once they're on a new platform, they realize that no one's really coming with them. There's nothing going on. So they go back and it's always like a cat and mouse game. So you can literally find them on any platform um, to summarize. Okay. Thanks, Laurent. What do other people think? So the question was, is what are some of the most important social media and other sites when investigating individuals and smaller groups? Any other thoughts? Go ahead, Liz. I think, oh, sorry. Oh, oh go, go, ahead. go first, go first. Um, I think one of the most important things and, and Laurent touched on this as well is where does this person come from? What is their, their, their language background, their cultural background, the country they live in? Um, because it's not all Facebook and, and Twitter and Instagram out there. Um, there. There are different sites that might be used. And one of the things that you also have to keep in mind is uh, the situation in certain countries. So, for example, in Germany, um, you might have the government putting a lot of pressure on mainstream social media to get rid of hate speech, um, even more than in other countries, because it is forbidden by law in Germany. So then um, people that would like to post things like that, 
would kind of move away from mainstream social media and find uh, other platforms to disseminate their information. So this could be moving away from Facebook to VK, for example, or moving away from Twitter to Gab. But I think at the end of the day, it all just comes back um, down to the cultural background of a certain individual next to the fact that Laurent stated they want to interconnect uh, basically globally. So, so those are the two things that I would kind of keep in mind. Okay. What was that? Uh, one of the things when I'm looking into groups is always to try to see if I know that the group is um, specifically linked to a country, so maybe a country other than the Netherlands where I live, is to check out which websites are popular uh, via like Alexa, um, but also checking out the apps that are popular in that country. Yeah, I use mostly Applizer, which is like a top chart of iOS or Android uh, used apps, either they're free paid or um, what was the other category again? Well, they have three categories and I just quickly check them to see if there are any different than the ones I normally would visit to research somebody or some group. And if there are different, I try to install them or create a profile, use it a little bit to see if there are any OSINT opportunities in there and then well, see if my target uh, group is there. Okay, so you mentioned uh, Applizer. There's also App Annie, uh, which is uh, not as, as wide ranging, I think, as Applizer. Um, and also there's uh, Alexa.com and Similar Web. Those two sites uh, tell you the, the most popular sites in, around the world or in a certain country that, that can be very useful. All right, and uh, there you go. Thank you, Technozet, for throwing that into the chat. Um, we will try to capture some of these URLs that are in the chat into the show notes. Laurent, you got that? Thanks, buddy. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and uh, move on. We have another question here. Has anybody read the complete book, Open Source Intelligence Techniques, seventh edition, and what are your opinions in retrospect? That's a pretty big question there. Have, have we read the entire book? I have not. Uh, I have the book. I think buying it's the most important part, right, Lizette? Yep, there you go. I think yep. most of us own I'm the book. I'm still not finished. I don't oh, have yeah. time I to agree. read. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. We all bought the book, but yeah, I yeah. haven't like, I, I, I read parts It's of like it. stuck in the middle. Yeah, I could get mine too. So, but, mine somewhere you know, here. <laughs> I think one of the things that, that I've started using it for is instead the of the other one, though, no. finish that one. Okay, that you got. Okay, you got to go back through all the different revisions. Come on. Come. No, 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 I know. I just got two. I got the okay. sixth and the seventh. I haven't finished reading the seventh. All right. Well, I'll sell you my fourth. I got it several years ago. <laughs> so, the, <laughs> the so so I think the way that I use it, and you all tell me if if it's if it's the same for you. I use it as a reference book. You know, as a I, I'm doing most of my stuff looking on technizet.com or osintechniques.com or or some other start me page for real world live current tools. And then when I get stuck on a certain thing, I'm like, okay, well, I've exhausted the things I know about. I've exhausted the things on the internet. Let's just see if there's anything in this book because the thing I don't like about books is that they get outdated really quickly. LinkedIn or Facebook or Telegram changes a, a UI piece and the technique doesn't work anymore. What are your thoughts? I think I actually have a first edition laying around. So the newer ones, I, I scan through them and like what's new, you know, like, just like you were saying, I, I, I'm going to see what changes and what's new. All right. Same as me, definitely as a reference. Um, if there's something where I'm like, hey, I've already gone to all the sites that I typically go to and I'm looking for maybe, you know, a better understanding of something, I'll, I'll definitely just uh, use use that as a resource if I need to look into a particular topic. Well, and while you're talking here, um, you, uh, Ritu, I tweeted out in your OSINT Techniques um, Twitter account, this Google dork for finding Start Me pages. Do you want to describe it a little bit? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, did, I think I posted that just um, like a few days ago. Um, so pretty much it was just how can we use Google dorks um, to locate, say, pages related to OSINT or uh, Sockman or privacy or Defer. Um, and, uh, you know, pretty much when you use the in URL um, Google dork, uh, 
I'm looking for start me pages because there's lots to do with like say open source intelligence. And I want to see the different resources people are using, maybe something we can find or I can find that will be helpful for me. Um, and throwing that into Google with those um, keyword searches of OSINT or SOCMINT or say you want privacy related start me pages. Uh, I found those quite helpful. Um, and I can, I can post the link if anyone wants to see what that looks like. Yeah, we'll throw that into the show notes. Thank you. Cool. All right. Um, let's see. So we have one more question here in our audience, and then we'll probably shift over to doing some new stuff because there's a lot of things that we can talk about. Um, let's see. So uh, Tenizo, which is OSINT backwards, uh, has posted a question. Uh, the LinkedIn ID has gone from the source code of a profile. While uh, for a while uh, he they could find it with the dev tools, but now it seems to be encoded. Have you looked into this? Anybody del dove into LinkedIn and looked at the user ID? Yeah, I'm actually looking at it now. Um, I think I saw it pop up in my timeline on Twitter about I think it was yesterday or the day before, and someone else said, no, it's back, it's working again. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether it's back or not. So, okay. but I was sort of already fired up another VM and I was already having a look. Cool. Because, hey, I'm OSINT curious. You are. You, you are like the definition of OSINT curious. All right, let's take a look at some of the things out there in the world of OSINT that were in Twitter and other places. Once again, if you are listening to us on the podcast or watching our video, we usually monitor the hashtag OSINTCurious on Twitter, LinkedIn, and other platforms to get people's uh, topics that they are talking about and that we can maybe share here on our webcast podcast. One of the things here that I noticed was uh, another topic that, that keeps popping up uh, is by Lockpicking Pete. I uh, did a poll on what OSINT, uh, do you, what OS do you run for your uh, OSINT VMs? Um, do you, are you using Windows or Tsurugi, Buscador, Kali? And I would have liked to see like an other category because I think some of us, we, we do use other uh, VMs or we make our own. Um, what are your thoughts? Just real quick, what do you all use uh, for your OSINT plat analyst platform Absolutely. in general? I, I, I build them for, uh, well, not really from scratch. Um, I use VirtualBox and I've got um, three base images, which is a Windows 10, freshly downloaded developer edition. Um, comes completely clean with a default user. You can download it from Microsoft and it runs for three months. Then can you give I've, us that link to Sector for the audience? Yes, I will absolutely add it to the show notes. Um, then I have a base uh, Xubuntu with an that's Ubuntu with an X in front of it um, because it's slightly more lightweighted than Ubuntu. Uh, I've got that just a base image, completely clean, nothing else. And I've got an OSINT base image. It's based on Xubuntu, but it has NordVPN installed. It has a bunch of um, useful and safe extensions and add-ons. It has Chrome and Firefox. It has a few Python scripts that are run on a regular basis and um, that's it. So basically I, I use those images. I clone them every time for when I want to research something different. I clone them completely with new Mac addresses and etc. cetera. I change the user agent um, within the browser and I'm off. So I don't okay. have to do a lot of things. I try to automate things as much as possible. And then besides that, I've got a lot of uh, personalized VMs for specific projects, sometimes a Windows, sometimes Ubuntu or something else. Okay. And uh, Matthias says uh, what Sector said, plus Mac OS VM. All right. Anybody else? Do you make your own? Do you use somebody else's thoughts? I usually use a Windows VM uh, just because it appears more normal and I can build my own tool set into it. Um, but, you know, depending on what I'm doing, I might be running Linux or off the Mac, what, what have you. Uh, I have a, a hardware Mac that I run VMs on that's also just used for 
this sort of thing and sandboxing. So um, I can run straight off the hardware too, but usually using that Windows VM and loading my own tools into it. Okay. Anybody else? All right, let's go back to Twitter. Uh, Christina Licati, I uh, mentioned something really interesting. I thought this was uh, a neat thing to bring up for us to talk about is, is it's about people that drop off Twitter and then Twitter and then pop back up in a different account. And she mentions that if there's a new Twitter account that already knows the community hashtags that will draw uh, attention to them and, and already knows and plays on the hot topics and uses, uses them methodically to draw on sympathy, retweets and visibility it might not be so much of a new account. I know that I've seen this several times where people will not burn an old account, just they will outlive, um, they will, uh, their, their old accounts are ones that have been compromised for one reason or another. Maybe they've tweeted out some things that were not safe for work or they don't want, they delete the profiles, but then they pick, pick back up. And the voice of their new account sounds very similar to the old one. Um, have you all come up with, have you all uh, seen anything with, with people creating new accounts and you being able to pull out, nah, I think that's this person? No, no, but what I find something similar is um, sometimes when I when I get a new follower, I sometimes check them out and I can see that this account is fairly new. It doesn't have any OSINs in the title, uh, so what. Um, but what's interesting is when you look at the followings, it's just OSINT, 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 OSINT. So I know that the whoever is behind this uses it probably professionally or for a hobby. So you can also deduct a lot of information from just by looking at this. So that was an interesting tweet as well. So, so that's actually a, a technique, right? Is that you see somebody new come on the scene. Let's just pivot and see and do some searches on Twitter and see what they've been doing. See if they have a real profile, like link to a, a, a secondary site. Uh, do, you know, five min minutes worth of kind of due diligence of, is this a person that's, that's new to the scene or whether they are longer term? Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, Lock Picking Pete, who's on here, we just mentioned him, um, says that the bot site browser add-on can also be used as an indicator for secondary accounts, not just for bots. Interesting. Bot site. Gonna have to check that out. All right. Let's head back to the Twitters. Now we have this whole section on Sinwindy here because a uh, big fan of Sinwindy's and Sinwindy just uh, did a couple of things more publicly, including speaking at the ConInt OSINT conference, which is actually still going on today. I think yesterday was talks, today's the CTF. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about ConInt earlier. I think Ray Baker also spoke there, Wondersmith Ray. Um, one of the things that Sinwindy does, and thank you for being in our audience today, Sinwindy. Uh, one of the things that Sinwindy does is puts together these attack surfaces um, on different social media platforms and different areas of open source intelligence. Uh, here's one from uh, his Twitter, uh, just tweeted out the this one for dark web marketplace attack surfaces. And um, while this is not like a how-to, uh, I think Simone described to me that it's more of a, a when you have a dark web site that you're visiting, or um, there's actually a bunch of these over in uh, his GitHub, in uh, github.com slash sinwindy slash osint. When you have one of these and you click on the attack surface, um, it pops up and it shows you the different places that are, are out there that you should check out to see if you have access to, see if there's data in before you finish doing OSINT on this profile or in this social media platform. Um, have you all ever seen these or, or used these? OSINT curious? Absolutely, I, I love them. Um, I love those little flow charts that you can always come back to them. So I actually download them and uh, uh, once in a while, I'll check whether there are some more or new features in it or uh, whether he changed something. But yeah, I, I absolutely use them. All right. I think they're also very valuable for um, a couple of my colleagues who are in the field who are not as um, advanced in doing OSINT as I am. This is for them a very structured way 
like a checklist. Like, have I been to all of the places where I can find information? Have I followed all of the right steps? They're excellent for that. So thank you, Sin Wendy. Yeah. I, I find Go ahead, read it. I was just going to say, I, I print them out and sometimes with different flow charts, depending on, again, because there's so many ideas and so many different uh, pivoting points when we're in, you know, uh, doing our research. Um, but I'll add my own notes to it. So if there's something new that I found, I'm like, hey, hey make a note, get the highlighter out, all that kind of stuff. But it's been quite helpful. Can I, can I ask a question, Ritu? Are you the one that posts them all on the wall and uses all those little strings and those, those thumbtacks like you see in those memes by any chance? Very similar. I got like a cork board, <laughs> like a massive one, and then I'm just, you know, and everything's just, it's, it's fun. <laughs> Old school. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right, so one other thing by Sin Windy, and this was something that Ben Strick just posted or tweeted um, that Sin Windy did a talk at Con Int about a live demonstration about how uh, law enforcement and other government organizations can lift fingerprints from social media sites. So you post a picture of your hand with uh, holding something and based upon the your what they can see in the picture, they can lift fingerprints. Um, I don't know much more than that, um, but I look forward to hearing more about that. Maybe uh, the Conant presentations are going to be online and we can well, I, jump in. I would like to uh, jump in on that because it's not exactly new. Because um, late December 2014, um, there was a photographer during a talk of Angela Merkel um, from Germany, the, prime, the, the minister in Germany. And... Um, the resolution of the images was so incredibly high that they used that photo to actually extract a fingerprint. They didn't use it, but they were already showing what was possible uh, late December 2014. So um, I'm, I'm really curious how it goes now with all the, uh, uh, the smartphones with the 20 plus megapixel resolution. It's just going to go downhill from here. And speaking of smartphones, you know, this this is a worrisome issue for biometric security, right? Um, you know, this is something people should keep in mind before they go snapping pictures of their hands. Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting because, you know, the, the world has evolved in, in a way. We used to think biometrics was really safe because they would have to come and find me and cut off my thumb and put it on some scanner. I know that's a little gruesome, but they did that on the movie, Lizette. They did. Um, they, I, but, you know, this is I'm something sorry. They, <laughs> I had an autoplay on. Um, I'm setting up some things for uh, the demo. Maybe, maybe we get to later on. And then some of the things started to autoplay. So I like. Really got a fright. Okay, sorry. <laughs> well, I mean, but we we used to consider this as something like really private. Like, wow, they're in order to get a, a picture of my retina, they're going to have to, you know, be right here, and I'll be able to fend them off. They, I won't let them take pictures or my fingerprints. They can't get that. But now that we're sharing, you know, these high res pictures of our of our eyes and our our hands and and other things, even the geometric ones, you, you know, I could. I won't put up my hand, but you can put up your hand and, and they can measure the distance because gumshoe, I know that somebody's going to do that, right? Micah's fingers are this long and all. Um, but I mean, you can do this now over the internet. It's it's not challenging to do. It's just the question of, can you use that? Yeah. And what would you and Famously do? recently, you know, again, this has been done in the past, but, you know, the guy holding the drugs and selling uh, on the marketplace that was then arrested from the prints, like this... This can be done. It's not that difficult with the super high res photo. And as you said, with the biometrics security issue, they seem secure, but then once it's out there, like you can't just change your fingerprints, right? Or, or your well, eyes. You can, but it really hurts. It costs a lot of money. I mean, you better have some big coin to do that. Cool. And um, let's see. So uh, uh, lock picking Pete said, oh, actually, uh, Nosen, uh says that the presentations will be available for the con int at conint.io slash 2020 downloads. And we'll include that in the show notes. Thank you for sharing that. Let's go to the section of the Osen Curious webcast that I like to call 
the Laurent Bodo Show. Um, Laurent, you've got actually several several tabs here. Uh, first off, uh, you want to tell us uh, you got a, a website that you put up, laurentbodo.com. Yes, exactly. So finally, I, I've decided to have my own website. Um, so I stopped working for NBC News. And then I thought it would be nice to just have my own portfolio where I can showcase all the work that I've been working on, but also link to all the dashboards that I created uh, over the years. So here's the terrorism radicalization research dashboard, but also another OSINT tools uh, startme.page um, the portfolio. And I will be also having a blog on there. So I'm currently writing uh, the first blog. Um, which will be on social search uh, media strategies. But overall, I want to keep uh, the theme more focused on terrorism and violent extremism. And uh, of course, continue blogging for Austin Curious as well. All right. And then you shared a couple of tweets uh, this past couple of weeks. Uh, this one was about using Reddit and, and uh, do, using RSS feed. Yeah, exactly. So Reddit is uh, a key source for, you know, when monitoring mis and disinformation. Um, so I was looking into Reddit and then I came across uh, this really cool thing. So I like to use RSS feeds to monitor stuff. And with Reddit, it's pretty simple to do that when it comes to um, creating an RSS feed for subreddits. So you manipulate basically the URL um, by adding the .rss and removing the, the slash in the end. And then your um, RSS monitoring tool will pick it up as a feed and you can start monitoring um, yep. the, the subreddit. And well, I think that's an important part because people moving from like the r slash intelligence to r slash intelligence dot RSS, that's going to give you an XML RSS feed here. And it's going to look odd unless you do process it within a, yeah. an RSS feed reader like Feedly or one of the other ones out there. So, um, exactly. but this is great because then you can aggregate all of those feeds, right? You can watch a huge number of sites in, in just one application. So that aggregation is terrific. All right. So, uh, Laurent, tell us about yeah. this First Draft News. Yeah. So First Draft News, an organization that um, works to kind of like uh, protect communities across the world from harmful disinformation. They have a couple of really good resources out there. And this is one of them. Just a quick overview of what, it, what the timestamp means on each platform. So when it comes to verification on social media, we should all know what the timestamp actually means. Uh, so YouTube, for instance, shows the time and date in PSD. And if you don't know this, then you kind of like conclude wrongly that, oh, the video was uploaded at 5 a.m. Um, UK time, but no, it's not. It's Pacific Standard Time. So it's just a quick overview of the main platforms. That's helpful. And uh, First Draft News, they also have the verification handbook, right? Uh, the Yes, so they also have a guide on verification, but the verification handbook is separate. So this is edited by Craig Silverman. And there are two editions out there, Verification Handbook 1, and uh, the most recent one is the second one. Uh, the website is also verificationhandbook.com, so it's easy to find. Thank you. And, and uh, we've got another one here. This yeah, is, exactly. uh, we that's verify. Just, uh, that's just an update on the um, verification plugin users um, that is often used. Um, uh, by a lot of journalists. I mean, I love to use it too. And they were just saying that this so this is from uh, yeah 3:30 p.m. yesterday that the plugin that they're they're experiencing some problems uh, with Chrome browser and you should use as a uh, Firefox as an alternative. And because I know that a lot of people use it, just make sure to use um, Firefox. And last but not least, I think this is the last one I, I submitted. It's basically a, a guide on how to data scrape, uh, how to scrape data with Google Sheets um, to assist journalists and uh, OSINT. And in this case, um, basically how to scrape with Google Sheets from Wikipedia. So the author scraped a lot of air bases in China and then mapped it out with Google. And it kind of like explains the process. Um, forget about the topic itself. It's more, I think the, in, the interesting part is the methodology on forget about Python. Forget about these Chrome extensions. Whoa, whoa, whoa there. Forget about yeah, Python. I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah, of course not. Because uh, I'm a big Python fan. But I mean, okay, all right. forget about these tools. Because a lot of people always think, oh, I don't want to learn Python. Let's try, um, uh, what is it, Google Sheets instead. I mean, this is for quick and um, like uh, quickly to, to scrape stuff. But here also the caveat is that you need to uh, kind of like, so this won't work with every single website. So here Wikipedia has a nice uh, list of, uh, table. Um, and it recognizes it. Whereas if you go on to other websites, um, you then have to use other tools such as Chrome extensions, data scraper, or Python, of course. Um, so oh, this, but this one, 
in, if you encounter any tables, uh, you should definitely give this a go. Um, it's pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. And I love, Laurent, that it's in the browser. You don't have to, because a lot of people are doing OSINT just with a web browser or, or an uh, something that's like a virtual web browser and they don't have access to the yeah. amazingly awesome Python powerful tools. Uh, they just have to use the web browser. So this is, this is great. Cool. All right. Um, let's head over to Matthias. Matthias, you found Leonardo's car. Tell us more about that. Oh, so yeah, I, whenever I travel, I'm always looking for nice exotic cars. And, and, and sometimes, you know, I, I just uh, go doing that online as well. I'm um, actually here. I, I was looking for cooking videos on YouTube and ended up finding this video of this Ferrari. I mean, that's how it always goes when we're on the internet. You're probably not looking at the right search terms. Just, just, no, it's, it's, it it's just, it's just going down the, those rabbit holes on YouTube. Um, but the, the kind of the gist of this article is basically that um, a lot of images on um, search engines and some social media platforms are OCR. So that if you, for example, search for a license plate number, um, you will get uh, certain results in Facebook or on Google. Um, results that are basically uh, not in written text anywhere. So even if you would go like to the developer tools on a website, for example, you would not find the license plate number in there. So that means that this image was OCR'd by Google or by Facebook. And then and just, you know, doing start, very, yeah. Uh, can you just, just briefly tell what is OCR? Oh, that's the uh, optical character recognition. Um, so it's basically just a process of identifying text in an image and then putting that text out in a machine readable way. That's uh, the gist of OCR. Um, and then next to that, the blog is just about using very, very basic uh, OSINT techniques to, to pivot and find information. So going from one, one source to another, finding another piece of information, in this case, a VIN number for a vehicle, going back to Google, trying to find something there. And then at the end, um, actually finding information that is kind of hidden on the website, so you can't directly see it, because it's not on the website, but it's maybe in the URL, maybe somewhere um, accessible through developer tools. Um, so just things to, to think about when you're Googling things and you get to a result and you can't see why you actually got that result, um, there might be more than meets the eye. So actually information that is kind of hidden somewhere in that page. So I highly encourage people to use the web developer tools when they are doing their OSINT research on, on web pages. Cool. And, and also, I'll, I'll just give you a shout out that that being like not OSINT curious necessarily, but OSINT observant, um, and I'm going to register that domain name, you know I am, we're going to create a whole nother group for <laughs> OSINT observant. Um, it actually sounds like a religious nonprofit, doesn't it? OSINT observant, oh, whatever. Um, but here, I'm looking at the, the picture that you put in your blog post, and I can tell that the VIN or the vehicle identification numbers at the end. And if I was looking at it in my browser, I might not have seen that because it would have scrolled off the screen. So taking those large URLs and 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 examining them, just you know, scrolling all the way to the right can be really useful. And I think um, we've also talked about the unfurl uh, URL unfurling uh, tool that can be used useful as well. Um, cool, thanks. Moving from Matthias to Sector. Sector, there's a bunch of things here about Google. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Epizios? What would you say? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Epios? Yeah. Sure. I, I've got no clue. Um, yeah, they've they've did some um, some programming on my hard manual labor um, into Google accounts, and Google IDs, and I really love what they have um, come up with. They created a small website. You enter a Gmail address or um, a live Hotmail address, whatever it is, as long as it's connected to uh, a Google service, like a Drive or Sheets or YouTube, and you can um, fill in the email address, and here you go, you get the calendar link, the maps link, and a photos link. Um, you can copy and paste those links into a browser uh, to see what is available to view publicly. Um, underneath the photos link, it is also possible that you see things like Hangouts or YouTube or other things. Those are other services that the uh, Gmail account uses. 
very nifty. Um, I really like it. I only use it for non-trivial uh, stuff because everything, anything that is sensitive, um, I just don't want it to touch that website, which is normal. Of course, if you're looking at, I don't know, maybe a nation state or something silly like that, if you're looking into the Russians, um, I'm, I'm not going to put in email addresses like that. I'll just do it manually still just to be safe. Okay. And the manual techniques for investigating Google accounts, can that be found on your sector 035.nl site or is that on your medium page? Or? Absolutely. On my sector 035.nl under articles. And I think the explanation on how to use Hangouts is in the second part of it. That's keeping, a, uh, I think it's keeping a grip on Google ideas. Well, you'll find it. All right. Now we wanted to just mention these other uh, these other two tools, uh, G Hunt, which I don't think we played with, right? No, I haven't played with it. I think I um, I did install it and I uh, tried to run it, but my Ubuntu didn't like the. I think it was the headless Chrome or something that it uses, and mm-hmm. I couldn't get it to work. So I did reach out to the developer. Um, but I haven't had the time to get in touch with him to to see what is actually wrong. Okay, so another tool that digs into uh, Google Activities, even for, uh, actually, this is for, um, is it just for Google? Yeah, it's for a Google account. Um, Absolutely. This one, does, this one requires you to grab a cookies and tokens, though, in order to work. So you do have to authenticate to Google, right? Yeah, absolutely. And after that, uh, I think what they do is they use uh, something like a headless browser to open up uh, all those different links. They dive into all the photo albums if there is anything um, that is open and they look at all the photos and they record things like uh, all of the metadata and exif data that might be still in the photos and they list all the locations, the phones, uh, anything like that. So re- really nifty tool, but yeah, I haven't uh, had the time yet to play with it. Okay. And then we have this last Google tool, which is actually not just Google. This is a, a general lookup. Have you played with this one yet? The holy, I want to say holy he, but I'm pretty sure that's not how it's, it's pronounced. Um, have you seen this? I have not seen it. You have not so this is a tool that is interesting. It's for educational purposes only. <laughs> that always makes me smile. Um, so essentially, th- this tool allows you to look up an email address. And let me just zoom in here. Um, this is the little animated GIF that they have. Uh, you run an email. It doesn't have to be Gmail, but you run any email address. And then from your system, it'll make requests out to I think it's like 40 different platforms and it'll look at and see, is that email found? And if so, you know, uh, it'll tell you the platform. Um, I find it interesting because it's very similar to like the what's my name project that I run uh, in that you provide it one piece of information. It goes out, grabs that content. And then based upon the responses coming back, it'll tell you if that's that accounts there. Um, it would be more interesting to take a look at how it's doing this and maybe understand, is it trying to do like, I think this one tries to set up a new account. And when it sets up a new account on some of the platforms, it says, oh, this ID's already been taken. So uh, that's that's one way, but interesting, interesting tool. All right, so um, this has been on Twitter for a little bit. Uh, Bazell released this uh, Intel Techniques slash messaging uh, HTML site. Uh, have you all seen this? Played with this? It shows about secure communications and different parameters. Okay, just me. Great. Okay, so um, Michael Bazell has released this uh, this tool, or it's been it's a, in beta, as you can see right here. This looks very similar to that one privacy site.net that rates all of the different parameters for the VPNs that are out there in the world. Um, here, he does it for different messaging platforms along the way and tells you uh, a variety of the uh, settings that he's been able to gather. So okay. another tool. Conant, we've already talked about. All right. And I see that we are just at a oh we're just at about an hour here so um i think we're pretty much 
ready to go. Um, questions by any of you all? Well, I Thank you. Do, do see one more question, and I want to answer that one live because Sancho is having some problems with this year, 2020. Um, and he wonders whether there will be a 2020 OSINT quiz coming before the end of the year. Um, I've been trying to get something off the ground, and I'm just lacking a lot of time. I really really love to get some people together and I'm looking at the screen right now um, to try and make something very, very cool and very special. I can't promise you that it's going to be uh, ready this year. And if it isn't, I will just make sure there's a new version of some kind of OSINT quiz at the end of this year. I'll do my best. Excellent. And if not, then, then it gives us something to look forward to in 2021, right? Not that we aren't looking forward to everything and anything in 2021, but this gives us something specific to look forward to. Cool. All right. Then that brings us to the shameless self-promotion section. Thank you to our attendees for, for sending all of these questions in. And thank you to you, our, our Twitter and um, our social media audience out there. We do appreciate all of you. Um, let's just go around the horn. Uh, Gumshoe, uh, any places that you're going to be or things that you want to promote in the last couple of seconds here? Go. Only thing coming up is uh, SANS class that I'm teaching starting November 30th. If you're interested, go to SANS.org and check us out. All right, let's go to Ritu. Um, real quick, uh, I updated a bunch of dead links on my website, osinttechniques.com, um, but I'm hoping to add more content, uh, hopefully in the near future. That's it for me. Excellent. Okay, so visit her website, Laurent Bodo. Yeah, just one thing. So um, if you want to go and check out my new website, uh, laurentbodo.com. Excellent. And hire Laurent. I'm going to start that hashtag. Uh, Technozet. Hi, everybody. You can find my resources at technozet.com and hopefully see you soon. Yep. And you, we're going to have a new blog post. From, oh, yes. Uh, yes. There's going, going to be a terrific new blog post. Everybody should watch out for OSINT Curious because it will be a blog post on how to find anything on a private Facebook profile, which was inspired by the blog by Headless Cider. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right, but yeah. yeah. And there'll be Did a 10 you? minute tip video too. And a 10 minute tip video to go with it. Yes. Just amazing. So stay tuned. That'll be this coming week. Sector 035. Absolutely. My newsletter is scheduled already for tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock. This is 6, uh, 6 a.m. UTC. Um, and besides that, I just remember that I have to write an extra tip about finding the member ID in LinkedIn profiles. So go. I got some work to do. Everything tomorrow morning, uh, Twitter, my handle is Sector035, and my newsletter can be found at Sector035.nl. Oh, cool. and last but not certainly, or certainly not least, our newest newlywed, if you will, uh, Matthias. So nothing specific for me, but given the fact that COVID is on the rise in Europe again, people, please stay at home and spend more time in front of your computer being OSINT curious. And being Best. less private, so we have more targets. <laughs> Best advice ever. That's right. Um, and I'm Michael Hoffman. I want to just uh, promote um, one thing. We are, uh, I, you know, you all know that I, I work with SANS and uh, the SANS Institute has announced that in 2021, there will be a two day free virtual OSINT summit, which is a free virtual conference. We are opening it up to anybody around the world since it will be virtual. So please go to the URL that will be put into the show notes to sign up for the OSINT and the SANS 2021 show um, uh, OSINT summit. Um, I have a discount code that lowers the price to zero for the OSINT summit. Um, 
okay, I don't really have a code. It's just the price is zero. Um, also, we are looking for people to talk. If this is your first time on that you think you might want to talk to a global audience of thousands of people, no pressure, um, but we, uh, we would love to have people of all skills and abilities talking about open source intelligence, privacy, operational security, all of the wonderful things that we talked about today and so much more. Um, also, we are offering um, mentorship. So if this is your first time possibly giving a talk, submit something to our call for presentations, our CFP. It's all on the link that we'll put into the show notes. And we will work with you to, uh, to develop your idea and to make sure that your presentation is super amazing. Well, I'd like to thank our OSINT Curious members here for another great hour. Thank you to our attendees. Thank you to our sponsors and our Patreon patrons. I guess there's just one last thing to say, right, everybody? And that's stay, stay OSINT Curious. All right. Goodbye, everybody. Take care. We'll Bye, see everyone. you in two weeks. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye.